Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am honored to have my old friend, Mr. Rob Hart, back on. Rob, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Bart. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Rob. So um, this is super cool. Today we are doing uh, kind of the start of what we'll call a mini series. Um, you have had many great experiences with tons of cool teachers uh, over the years. And, and I want to say first that your first time on the podcast was episode 104 in 2021. You did uh, Tony Williams' clinic breakdown where we played a lot of clips. I know people loved that one. It was really cool. We're doing that style again, where you recorded a lot of clips with um, your teachers. We have uh, clips that on this episode, we're talking Steve Smith, but we also have Mike Clark, Robbie Gonzalez, Scott Morris. But as I just said, today we're talking particularly about um, your time with Mr. Steve Smith. So I think this is going to be super cool. Rob, what happened? How did you get involved with Steve Smith? All that good stuff. I was fortunate to have... Um lessons with um, some really um, incredible musicians through my life. I was uh, really, really fortunate to study with Steve from 1985 to about 2000. Um, I saw him go through all these different phases in his life. He had been working with Journey. Journey was on a hiatus. Um, he had, there has been this thing where he was asked to leave, then they rehired him. And, you know, there's all this stuff going on. But um, he had a studio at his house. He lived in, in Marin, and um, he had built the studio in uh, 1984, the year I graduated from Berklee College of Music. Mm. And I met him in 1985. Uh, he invited me. I saw him at a Tony Williams uh, show in San Francisco. He invited me to take lessons. I said, do you teach? He said, no. Uh, I, I was taking with Gary Chafee and, and Berkeley. In Boston, and and uh, we kind of had some of the same interests. And he says, "Well, why don't you come over? Here's my address." Um, so, what had happened is, um, and he had that big journey set set up, and he sat down and played for me. Um, now he had done. There was a Zildjian day in Boston at the Berkeley Performance Center, and so um, that was around the time. So that was eight, 1984, and then I graduated eighty five. So he. Um, you know, was in that kind of journey mode. He played differently. He's gone through all the evolutions of playing differently. You know, um, he's gotten better and better and better, always improving. But this was that time, uh, probably about 19, I'd say 1987 or something like that. So this one's called uh, Applied Soloing. And he had electronics, which were called the Dynacord, which were mm. like these uh, kind of... Uh, would you say like triangular pads and he would set up a, 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 a clap or a cowbell or different things. Uh, we were getting, you had your last episode about electronics. Um, Dave Weckl had the uh, uh, triggering electronic sets. I think he was triggering Simmons drums at the time. That was a big thing sure. around the electric band. So he was experimenting with electronics and, and triggering as was really popular in the eighties. So there's a little bit of that in here. Um, there is a click that's a four bar phrase, which is in half notes. And then the last half note of the fourth bar is silent. That's always the click time practicing tool. So um, this is applied soloing track number one. Okay, let's check it out.
Very cool. All right, Rob. So talk to us a little bit about that. I mean, his his mastery of the click of, you know, it's like you can hear it and go, is he on? Is he off? And then, bam, he's right back on. He's just working around it and playing with it. And I love the use of the electronics. Tell us about that a little bit. So we would do lessons. And I want to say that, you know, his studio was um, it wasn't big. It was small, but very beautiful, you know, and he had a little sliding glass door with the with the uh, control room um M- mci board um uh and and uh two inch tape so we had mm-hmm. the the big washing machine two inch tape deck um and um so he would close the door you know and it would be the the um i guess double door um control room and then the the live room um in the live room, he had, um, you know, various sets he set up. He had the double, the double, uh, uh, what would you say, soundproof doors, you know, like closing yeah, the yeah, vault. Yeah. The airlock kind of thing. <laughs> the airlock. Yeah. And so it, it was all set up. I think that the next in the, in the hallway down from that was like his, the kids' bedrooms, you know. Um, but it was totally soundproofed. And um, he would just, you know, like he had that big set. And he had all the Zildjian cymbals and the sonar drums. And uh, I would just be blown away. He would just play and it would just be like jaw dropping. He was very yeah. accurate. So when we would do the click stuff, he would demonstrate playing with a click. And and um, we would work on the counting. So he would count out loud and play. And um, And what would happen is he would just say how he would keep on the click by doing those subdivisions. And that's right. how we would practice like playing around the click. But it was sure. so on, it was scary. And if you ever play with a click where you're you're doing a fill, and then when you come out of the fill, it's kind of a little bit like your snare drum's a little late. And then yeah. you kind of get back on. It's not like you're moving off of the click, but you're a little, you know, it it's it's like you listen back and you hear a flam or you hear something. A little behind yeah. like he could be dead on and he would tell me stories of um i think the album was called fia fiaga and how uh they brought in um dave weckel's buddy um jay oliver and they would actually produce um the uh rhythm to the millisecond like when they would they would record and he wow. goes i i don't like to do that anymore but he goes at the time i wanted to see if i could do it so this is before yeah. really Pro Tools. This is before the the editing and everything and putting yourself to a grid. I mean, you sure. were actually playing to tape. Uh, you could punch in, but if you were, you know, if anything was sloppy or uh, anything like that, I yeah. mean, you had to actually do a whole new take. And and this is- No, and it was a different world. And the, the studio I worked at uh, a couple of years ago and through, you know, college, I interned, they had, it was a big MCI board. There was the big washing machine, uh, two inch tape, MCI, uh, you know, machine as well. And I remember there was an outboard uh, piece of gear that was a metronome that was called a Russian dragon, which I always thought was a cool name, like rushing or dragging. And it was the Russian dragon. Nothing was as easy as now where it goes- add click track on change tempo you're good so that adds another level of just like uh complexity and let me just clarify with can you explain the recording of these of what we're hearing back okay so that one was uh in his studio it was a studio recording with his all his gear put the tape in because we used to have cassette tape that's that was our medium and so he would put the tape in the tape deck and he would record yeah. So he ran the wow. two inch tape and then, you know, either he'd make me a copy or he recorded on the fly. Other recordings that you're going to hear are my, the Sony Walkman I had that was, in fact, I was trying to look for the model number. It this thing was a, it was just a workhorse, you know, press yeah. record, put it down and then you're, you're, you're good. Well, I hope we can probably tell the difference between a probably $50,000 MCI board. Well, both Sony, I think Sony owned MCI, though the MCI board and your Sony Walkman. We'll probably tell a difference. No offense to the Walkman. (laughs) Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Blue Goose Classic Percussion. Blue Goose Classic Percussion has provided vintage drum restoration and sales online for over five years. They are pleased to announce that they will be opening Atlanta Drum Shop, a full-service drum destination in Atlanta this summer. 
featuring new and used gear by all your favorite brands. Vintage drums are their original and strongest passion, and they currently have hundreds of vintage sets in inventory. Some, but not all of the inventory is online. So if you're looking for something in particular, it's best to get in touch directly. They're opening to the public this summer, 2023. Join the mailing list to get updates at atlantadrumshop.com. Their social media is at Atlanta Drum Shop. And if you love vintage drums and cymbals, check out bluegoose.com. That's B-L-O-O goose.com. And Blue Goose Classic Percussion on eBay. That's B-L-O-O Goose Classic Percussion. So thank you to Blue Goose and Atlanta Drum Shop for sponsoring this episode. Let's move on to the next one because I'm, I'm gonna. it's going to be my job to keep us on track and get as many of these in as possible. So uh, that one was awesome. Clearly a master. Uh, let's do some more and just and then we'll go from there. Okay, let's go to opening and closing the hi-hats. All right, here is Steve Smith. Uh, this is about opening and closing the hi-hats. Here we go. Okay, so when you were playing that, you can check out that your hi-hat needs to be a little more like real, real precise, right? Real, like even, even shuffle, right? You play real shots. about like when you're closing this like there's that can be part of the rhythm that should be part of the rhythm the actual place that you close the hi-hat so like be be aware of where, where you close it because it didn't sound like you were mm-hmm. you were you thinking about the actual what subdivision of the beat the hi-hat closes mm-hmm. on it was just opening and it was closing whenever right mm-hmm. okay like it's really important to think about that because you can you know So it's like when I I kind of you know I kind of and then I let it I have trouble with that kind of two sticks. Cool. That was awesome. I, this is again, what I love about this is, is the hearing this lesson. And, uh, and I've, I've heard these before, but really to kind of do this in, in, in real time is awesome. Things I wrote down that Steve said, and then you, you should touch on this cause it was you there, what, 35, 36 years ago or whatever. So he's obviously talking about close the hi-hat, make it a part of the rhythm. Every piece of what you're doing is, is a part of it. As you listen to it, you go, yeah, yeah, it seems obvious. But when you're learning and you're in the lesson, it's like, it's awesome. And then I just wrote that and underlined that he said, it just sounds cleaner. It sounds clean. And he's exactly right. It sounds clean and it sounds tight and every little nuance is, is perfect. So tell us about that, that day, that moment, what was going through your mind and what did you, you know, uh, what was that like? Well, the reason why I picked that clip is because, um, that was a real life changing moment for me. Uh, I struggled so much with the with the left foot in the hi hat opening and closing, and uh, there was a lot of independence between the right foot and the left foot. Right, so you would do something with your right foot, and your left foot would suffer. Happened, you know, it was like kind of always my, um, you know, uh, uh, weakness. So he would just point out closing the hi hat. I mean, you're opening a cl- hi hat. You're trying to get that. Uh, a lot of times, the articulation of your left foot and your your hi hat, your right hand or left hand, trying to make those um, coordinate. And if they're a little bit late, if you don't close a hi hat right, it's sloppy. If you don't open the yep. hi hat in time, it's sloppy. 
right? Yep. Especially when you get into 16th notes. So he was, you know, a master. His feet were incredible. I, he always had this thing where he just, everything he did. So the feet were so clean. And just being able to notice not only where you're opening the hi-hat, but where it closes and what part of the beat. And that really, like I said, that just changed my life. Just uh, being aware of all these little subtleties of where that's going. And so if you play a 16th note with your bass drum, you know, that's independent of your left foot, you're wor really working on how those two uh, coordinate. And then so you can get yep. that clean close hi-hat with your left foot and the right subdivision while being independent, uh, a clean hi-hat with your left foot being independent of your right foot. Yeah, and uh, it's the difference between good and great, really. Like, it's it's day one, you can learn whatever you want on drums, and at that point, you're a Berkeley grad. I mean, you know what you're doing. You sounded great playing it, but to sit and hear someone like you, it was very well established at that point, compared to Steve Smith, who again, who's famous mega drummer at that point, it's there's always that next level, and everything he said, I like how he was like, he kind of, uh, in a nice way, he kind of called you out a little bit. There's oh, yeah. a little bit of a teacher of just like, you weren't paying attention, were you? It's like, <laughs> you're not, you're <laughs> not right, doing you're it, right. are you? It doesn't sound like you're doing it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, that that was cool to hear that. So, all right, let's keep going to get as many as, as we can in. So what do we have next? Uh, this is going to be about playing time. Okay. All right, here we go. Steve Smith talking about playing time. First step is learning, learning the songs, right? Any new gig. You're, you're, you know, concerned with learning the, the arrangements and the songs and the right drum beats and stuff like that. So that's like step one. So once you get past step one, then what? Then I consider the next step is to make sure that every song has real even tempo and really good feel. So then that's like the next stage. Once you get past learning the songs, then you can like listen to the tape and and like really determine if your tempo is really steady and if the feel is really good. So then that gives you like the next thing to work on. Make sure that everything too feels and is consistent, right? And then the next level, like once you feel really comfortable with that, it's like then you can really start getting inside the beats and the fills to make sure that you're playing like hip stuff and and then if you can fit in anything like that could be hip or more challenging to you but still work within context to the music and then like you can so really refine um, like get really get inside each and every tune to come up with hip or more interesting things to play and, and then just make judgments on your execution, your touch on each instrument. And, you know, so you can just like keep getting more and more microscopic with everything that you do. So it's not boring. So you're not just playing these same songs over again and sort of stuck in on, you know, this is a boring gig. It doesn't have to be, you know, you can like, whatever the gig is, you can really get into it and get more and more microscopic with it. That makes sense? Yeah. Sometimes I, I have an attitude of I just, sometimes I think about it, sometimes I just want to get it over with. Sure. Be burning or something. But what happens is that I think is, even though a gig can be boring, it, well, it, it, it only is as boring as... Uh, it's, it's not, that, you're it's, not, it's not really, a boring gig, but, yeah, it's but just sometimes not, I just want to get it over with because I'm tired or something. Right, if you don't have the... But the songs are challenging. Yeah, so if you keep the perspective of that it's playing, it's time on, on your drums, it's time playing music, and it's you can always use that to better yourself, better your playing. Then what happens is you get the most out of the gig. So then you can get to a point... Like, there's... I, you know, whatever the gig is, you can always play it better. Right. And and all gigs are pretty much open-ended because music itself is open-ended as far as how much you can get out of the thing. Some gigs are obviously more open-ended than others. Like a jazz thing, fusion thing, has a much higher ceiling of where you can go than a pop gig. 
know, but but you have like a lot more limitations to work with, with the pod thing, a lot more parameters that are like kind of restricting. But you can still um, apply those that those theories to it. And then when if you do that and truly develop, right, then then there'll be a point where you are where it's real logical for you to take another step to another group or something. Um, because you, you're you doing it so well, it should be so obvious that if somebody hears you from another situation, there might be another level up that you can easily, you know, say if that's what, you know, what you want to do, move to another gig. Or that's my theory, right? That's my approach that I use on the gigs that I do, and if you would steps ahead, I mean that's a real open-ended gig. But I go through the. I first I learn the songs, you know. Then I listen to the time and to the feel, and then I get into the parts, and then I make sure that everything I play is hip. And then, then I like think about, gee, what can I do with this section? What can I do in this solo section? Or you know. When I'm off the road, I'm listening to tapes and practicing stuff. So the next time when I go back, I'm fresh and I have new things that I can play and like that. Even though we're playing the same songs a lot, so I keep working on the stuff. Now that's a much more open-ended gig, um, but the same theory I think works. I did the same thing with Journey too, and that was more you know straight straight ahead. But still, I could fit it into context. I could figure out ways of sneaking cool stuff in. That was a cool one. That's like, uh, I mean, he is a wise man. <laughs> like, I think we all know that, but a lot of times you just see him play and you don't hear these like behind closed doors conversations. The things I wrote down were, don't get stuck on a boring gig, dot, 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 little bit in between, get more and more microscopic. That's incredible. And then it's time on your drums it's time playing. And then he said something about, we all just need, we all need that. Pretty huge. Again, what's, what's your thoughts on all this? Well, at the time I was doing, uh, what we used to call, you know, there was like in-house bands or, um, popular, they used to call it top 40, but it was popular music at the time. There was a lot of clubs and, um, there's a lot of work. You'd play, uh, five nights, six nights a week, there are four and a half hour gigs. And you're playing the same songs over and over and over again. You know, you get burned out, but um, what would happen is um, you would try to come up with ways. I mean, you're learning parts, you're learning parts and you're, you're, you're memorizing the form and um, the dynamics and the tempos. We used to have a click track. You play to a click, a sequencer. Uh, sure. So, how do you work on things? I was the only one in that band that actually practiced um, because, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on that were uh, extracurricular uh, in those days. And I yeah. was a practiceholic. I love practicing. So I would try to figure out ways of, of getting better. Um, so you would take a, a situation where uh, you could be in a deadlock and being uh, bored with the gig and, and like, oh, man, I'm just doing the same thing over and over and over again. And then take that and and like how can I make how can I make how can I improve on it? What what can I do to to make things better? You know, learning the song when you first learn a song, it's fresh. When you play it a million times, not so fresh. You know, you start to yeah. get burned out on it. Um, well, you can add different parts. You can make things interesting. You'd say I I I'd listen to the gig and I'd go back and go. Well, I can improve this part. I can improve that part. Or you know, he taught me to tape everything, and and Robbie also taught me to do that. So you tape the gig, and then you you listen back after the gig. And this is not during an event that would happen on the gig. Somebody gives you a dirty look, or uh, you know, some some traumatic thing happens on the gig. You know, you take the tape home and you listen to it later, and then you're the judge of what happened. Now, the time maybe the time was slowing down or speeding up. You would go back and listen to the tape. There's the proof, right? Maybe the fills you played weren't right, or maybe uh, maybe you rushed the fill, or uh, you know something happened in that process. You could go back and listen 
and be the judge of what what happened on the gig. So I started doing this all the time with everything. And, um, you know, it got me into learning my own arrangements in my own trio, um, learning what works, what doesn't work. You know, oh, I thought I played really great, you know, on this gig. And then you go home and it's like, oh, that wasn't so great. Or, oh, I thought yeah. I sucked on that gig. Wow, I that wasn't, wow, that's pretty cool. I didn't. I didn't know that. Yeah. I, I didn't know I played that, you know. So it got into this yeah. thing of the musical microscope, but taking something away from the gig. Tony would say I'd listen to myself play all the time, but Steve was like, take it home, record it, and listen to it, and then judge yourself. He'd always say to me, like, you know what you like. You know what's good. You be your yeah. own judge. You can also drive yourself nuts doing that. You don't want to focus too much on that, but you also want to focus on it enough where you do care. Where you there's a there's like a happy medium where it's like exactly where you want to be. But um, let's continue chugging along on the Steve Smith uh, train here. And um, what do you want to hear next? I'm loving this. Okay, so this is the next clip is uh, playing along with uh, vinyl information tracks. Okay. Now I just want to say before we start it is that I could have sworn. This was on one of the albums, and and I I actually did talk to Steve um, in in the prep for the podcast, and um, he was saying no, it was uh, a track they never used, hmm. and I and I went back and I went to the, they released the early albums um, on on uh, uh, CD, uh, it's on it's on the uh, streaming platforms too, but sure. um, so oh man, I tried to find it and it wasn't there. But I could have sworn the mel. I remember that chorus, and I haven't listened to these tapes. And you know, God, it's been forty years or thirty years or something like that. So yeah. I, it, so anyway, he would put the track on, you know, and um, he had a Apple One computer. He had a uh, it was a sequence platform called Performer. I think they called it Digital Performer after that. Sure. Um, he was sequencing. He was he was. Uh, playing keyboards and piano. He actually had a grand piano in the studio for a while. And um, he'd go, okay, he would play with the track and then he'd go in the control room, goes, now it's your turn. So then I played with the track. So this is cool. him. He's in the control room. He's saying, hey, can you hear it? You ready? Here we go. And it's you playing. It's me playing along okay, with the vital cool. information track that he tells me they never used. Well, hey, it's a it's a drum history exclusive, I guess. So Rob Hart on the vital information track that was never released. So let's check this one out. I can't do it, but I'll try. I mean, I'm not even or anything yet, see? Well, that's what you can work on. You hear it?
That sounds great. Cool track. Great plane. How old were you at this point uh, when you were taking those lessons? Probably about 35, 34, okay. 35. Yeah. Sounding very good. I mean, let me ask you real quick. So you and I might have misheard it, but so you said when you were sitting down, you said, I'm not even yet. Yeah. What do you explain what that means a little bit? Are you talking about even with your kind of getting set up on the kit or even with your time, even with your feel? Got it. You know, um, interesting. So sitting down playing, he literally would put on these tracks that have a lot of parts. There's there's a part like I, I faded it out before I went to I messed up, but there was a, <laughs> you know, it goes into a break or something, you know, and yeah. uh, goes into another part. So sure. sounded really good. I would I would say something like, you know, I I don't know the arrangement. I'm not even yet. I'm Got I'm it. winging it, you know, and you go, well, yeah, yeah. that's what we're working on. Yeah. So that's awesome, though, that you get to sit there. And did you feel a lot of nerves? Did you it must have gotten easier over time playing yeah. in front of him. But did, were you nervous playing in front of Steve Smith? Probably at first. I remember the very first lesson when um, I was studying with Gary Chafee and I'd come back from Boston to the Bay Area and uh, I was playing. There was something called linear time feel. And, and so Gary had these books out that was. He had polyrhythms and they had sticking. So that was the books that Steve had worked out with him because Steve and Vinny took lessons together with Gary Chafee mm. um, in Boston. And this linear time feel had come out later. It had like fat back and like independence, like, the, you know, the whole thing with Terry Bozio with the ostinato, like Chafee mm. was doing that, you know, in the 70s. So um, I sat down and I started demonstrating this linear stuff and, he goes, well, that's good, but you're like, you don't have to impress me by playing it so fast. Sure. <laughs> you can, Makes you sense. can play it slower. Yeah, you're like, you're Steve Smith. I'm going to try and impress you. That's human nature. But I'm, I'm sure that happens with any relationship or once you get to know people. He really sounds like a good teacher. Like a, like a, it sounds like you had a very, like, uh, I guess the word would be like immersive type of lesson where let's gonna we're gonna play now you're gonna be in this you're also getting studio experience which is huge right yeah. yeah he taught me about um not only about uh being in the studio about playing live you know i said about working on parts um yeah uh he would teach me about doing how to do a clinic you know because I, I i started to do clinics and i'd i'd come in and i'd say like i i don't know what to do and how do i how do i run a clinic and it goes let's run it down and then I would bring my notes and he goes, okay, I'm, I'm the audience member. Like, what are you going to do? And he'd teach me how to do a clinic. Sure. Um, That's huge. It was huge. And even yeah. financial stuff, like he, his uh, accountant, he said, okay, here's the guy, this, this accountant does Grateful Dead and Journey and um, Jefferson Starship. And here, I'm going to give you this guy and, and he's going to help you. My dad had passed away and, um, and and I was going through this journey in life of what to do. And he goes, Yeah, here's how you're gonna here's a guy to talk to you for your investments. And this is what I did. And um, you know, this this guy's gonna do you right. I I, I trust this guy. So he wow. gave me, you know, not only was it musical um inspiration and mentorship, he also gave me uh, you know, life mentorship, like what to do in in, in a situation of like, I'm inheriting money. What do I do? How do I invest? Where do I go? Yeah. So there was a lot of aspects, you know, when you develop this trust with a mentor that you can actually trust them with your life, you know, like with like, hey, what do I do in this situation? A lot of people uh, would blow their money, you know, or or do something foolish, right? Yeah. Maybe they got um, into trouble. They were, you know, doing drugs all the time or, you know, all these situations like um, you have a mentor there to, to really uh, guide you through life, you know? And, yeah. and going through these situations where, um, you know, like you said, they had the wise knowledge of like, hey, man, I've been there. You know, I've been through this. This is this is how, you know, how I steered my 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 life and I can help others do the same. Absolutely. Something special about a drum teacher. I, I used to teach kids uh, primarily back when I was working as a drum teacher. And that was, I guess, where I it would just happen. I was at Sam Ash and doing private lessons. and It would always be younger kids. And there was one, I think I've told this on the podcast before, so forgive me if people have heard it, but a kid said, you know this better than anyone, I'm sure. People like to just talk to you because, again, it's you're there. Why not? I want to share. You're the cool guy drum teacher. I want to talk to you. 
but a little kid said, my dad told me to grow a pair. What does that mean? And I was like, oh, geez, I'm sorry. He was like, he was like six years old. So it was sort of one of those deals where I was like, and and they were from a different, it was like a different culture from like a different country. And I didn't know what was culturally acceptable and all that. And I was just like, I don't know. Ask your mom <laughs> or something. I'm not going down that, that road, but you, you need to be there for kids and people. And, and it's nice to have a, an ear to listen to and also someone to, to steer you in the right direction. But, um, very cool. All right, Rob. So let's let's keep chugging forward here. We have a fair amount left, but um, what do you want to go to next? Uh, let's go to playing the eleven eight figure, and this is um, Steve was taking piano lessons, um, and he would play piano, and I would play drums and accompany him. Uh, he was working. We would play standards, working on you know playing standards. Um, I have a, a recording of him playing uh, Stella by Starlight, and I'm accompanying him. Uh, wow. This was something we started jamming, you know, and uh, doing like an ECM kind of jam. And then he came up with this figure, um, 11 8 figures, and then he started saying, okay, solo over this. And then, and then you kind of hear me where I'm kind of like, whoa, I'm, I'm, you know, the rug is pulled out from under me. I'm trying to go yeah. get my bearings. And he goes, no, just, just think of it as this. And then as it goes on, I start to get comfortable with it. And he's like, yeah. And then, and then we, we kind of start, it, it starts getting better and better. And, we, and uh, that's, that's the, the clip. That's awesome. All right, let's check it out. This one looking, looks like it's a little bit of a longer one. So we'll check it out. Remember, Steve Smith is on piano. Rob Hart is on drums. 11-8. They're figuring it out. So here we go. Let's check it out. on the beat and then off the beat like you know one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven you know what i mean but here listen what this like watch my foot right yeah. like you know you know i didn't start i didn't start hitting one in the middle uh -huh. you know what i mean i didn't go like Twice through is yeah, one yeah. once is so one frame. Like, go like no, don't turn it around. Play straight through it. Listen like this. Like Very interesting. It's neat to hear Steve Smith playing the piano first off and what you played sounded great. You're definitely right where 
you as time went on you fell into it more and you got that that groove but one thing about steve is and, and, and like i said great plan by you but with steve is like even when you're figuring it out he didn't get off at all like he didn't really stop or change he's just chugging along and i think that's a big part of like uh that next level expertise is like whatever you're doing is fine but i'm not going to get off so pretty cool that 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 good job playing there yeah i mean you you kind of uh, as he went on you start to get used to the the figure yeah. and he just starts playing he goes well think of it like this so i don't know if you know when you're playing um an odd time Right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. One. That's what he was talking about. Yes, sure. It turns it. It automatically comes back. That was like the yeah. Narda Michael Walden thing on on the Jeff Beck uh, lead boots. Yeah. You know, like he did that on yeah. the bridge. The bridge is in seven. Sure. And um, so Where, that's like, the, the concept. second time through, you find yourself just wait, like do it twice, and then it the way the math of it all kind of lines up correctly exactly yeah and so you start yeah. to feel it and then you get comfortable and then you can solo over it uh he would play stuff he yeah. would have this stuff in like 516 you know really kind of hard to to to, to settle into that that was the track you know yeah i don't think i got but, that one i mean it's fun to you don't get to do that. You don't like go home and go, let me put on this crazy 516 track. You need someone in this case of this series that we're doing here, the a mentor to push you, even if it's like, wow, that was too far. Or I didn't I didn't get that at all. It's like, well, when then when you rewind a little and go to something a little more in your comfort zone, you're better at that because you just pushed out of your comfort zone. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Boy, that was cool. Okay, does Steve still play piano? I'm sure. I mean, if that was such a long time ago, I'm sure he's he's even more accomplished these days. That's a good question. He's downsized, you know. So I don't, I oh, don't yeah. know if he has a, a, all that that gear he got rid of. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, he told me he sold that piano to uh, Frank and Bali. Oh wow. Okay. Well, pianos are a big lot of space, and uh, if you're playing a piano at a certain degree, uh, they're s extremely expensive as well. So I'm yeah. sure it's nice to get a little. Uh, payday off of that so all right let's what you know let's try and squeeze in a few more here so um where do you want to where do you want to go from here rob metric modulation okay sounds good here we go steve smith metric modulation and getting out of like playing sevens and fives
Okay, so you're and you're always keeping. Your- Very cool to hear that. And you, though, as a student, it's cool. I mean, your your question there at the end there, you kind of breaking it down. You're really paying attention. You're really listening, obviously, of course, because you're sitting there. But it's not the easiest thing to kind of keep up with the counting that he's going on when when just kind of could just be freestyle grooving. Um, One thing I'll pull out that is that he said at the very beginning, I don't want to do things that are so literal. Can you explain that a little bit, what he's talking about? I guess that um, maybe the thing that everybody typically plays or, you know, if he's doing a five or people play fives and they accent one. So yeah. he would take he would take a, gr- a five note grouping a, a quintuplet, and um, he would accent like every third note or he'd accent every fourth note, and then he started making that a tempo, and then I think at the end he went to six. It's really hard to follow if you don't know what's going on. A lot yeah. of the metric modulation stuff it's the it, it it appears that you've gone to another tempo or like you said like free form. It's all. It's all laid out. There is a mathematical equation to everything he's doing, but the ear doesn't hear it. So um, as you practice that stuff, um, your ear, if you're not paying attention, your ear will go somewhere else and you'll get lost. But if you pay attention, you're hearing what the actual original tempo is and you're hearing the new tempo against it, which you modulate, and then you can get back and forth. That's a really hard thing to do um, is to take those note rates and then playing like every third note every fourth note and then making that a new tempo um it's really yeah. advanced stuff and yes you get lost really easily uh yeah. but um sure that that thing that he was doing he was playing every fourth um five um groups of four with the with the quintuplets and then he was playing a regular backbeat so you can kind of hear where the time is but he's accenting um the uh the every fourth five on his uh right hand with the bass mm. drum i to me in like the simplest terms of all of that is just like it's a total breakdown of just like he's got complete freedom over everything brain hands feet to do whatever he wants and not get lost and it makes sense to it which uh i guess that's that's why we practice to achieve that that level of freedom but um pretty cool all right rob so Love that one. Um, why don't we do one more? It looks like we've got a nice long one uh, to close things out that would be Steve Smith trading fours. Does that sound like a good one to close things out with? Is that both of you guys trading fours together? Yeah. So the thing that we used to do, this is a this is really a drum lesson thing. that, um, And I did this both with my early teacher, Scott Morris, um, is we would trade fours or eights in the drum lessons. So... Um, I, this is something that I think we've we've gotten away from with online lessons because you're not in the room with somebody and 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 you would never do something like this. But this is a normal thing. We would learn how to solo and phrase. And um, he's playing uh, the tune Olio um, by Sonny Rollins. He's quoting the melody in the beginning, and then we're into trading fours. Um, we're taking a jazz sensibility, so I'm playing off of him, he's playing off of me, and so we're, we're not only are we trading fours, but we're listening to each other. And um, this was such a great thing to do because it would really elevate your playing. I was doing stuff I never thought I could do, you know? Yeah. And he does not hold back either. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it, you know, this, this playing elevation comes out of it. Um, so I think it's about like five minutes. Okay. And um, yeah, I just think it's a real beautiful track. The other thing, I, I, I think in the middle of it, I lose it. And I go, ah, and it, he just keeps going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll start here, but I just think too of like what he said earlier on the uh, third clip you played, even when he's doing a lesson, it's time on your drums. It's time playing. He's like, I'm trading fours. He's practicing while doing the lesson with you just makes sense. You know what I mean? It's it's time for him to practice as well. So um, here we go. Like Rob said, this will be about five minutes and then we'll come back and we'll hear more about what Rob uh, will hear about his, you know, the, his drum school and everything like that that he's got going on and uh, his lessons and uh, we'll close out after that. So here we go with uh, Steve Smith trading fours with Rob Hart.
Wow. I mean, let, let me just say, first off, great job hanging and holding your own and performing at a level. It's just towards the back half of it. I mean, literally after you kind of went, oh, I got off. You guys, if, for a lot of it, I'll say for people who are listening on just the podcast, Rob has created a really cool visual with pictures that goes, it, it visually will tell us Rob's playing, Steve's playing, Rob's playing, Steve's playing. It really became hard to tell who was doing what because you were hanging so much with him. But let me say early on when he just kind of started, it was like, to, to use your words, he did not hold back at all. <laughs> he just jumped right in and was like, I'm going for it, which pulled you up to a level that was like, like you said, wow, I probably didn't know I could even do that. Well done, man. That was awesome. Yeah, I wanted to say for um, for the people just listening on on uh, just the podcast audio, uh, I am the first soloist, and I'm on the left side. He is on the right side. Now you could tell oh, cool. <laughs> who's who, but you know that's helpful, though. That's helpful, right? Yeah. So yes, I did the I did the video of of um, different pictures. With sure. you said the Ken Ken Burns effect, so it is the Ken Burns style. Yep, yeah, incredible. That had to be so much fun, and uh, it's truly I don't know many things that'll make you better than trading fours with Steve Smith, because you probably heard him do something, and the goal is it's not really like a oh don't copy me type thing. It's no let me oh let me let me try your idea, Steve. Let me do this. That's so cool. Yeah, that's a jazz mentality. You know, you play yeah. off of each other I I interaction. Yeah. So somebody plays something and then you play it back to them. And that's, you know, the beauty of improvising. Yeah, absolutely. Man, that one was awesome. Perfect one to kind of uh, close things down with. And um, uh, I will say that uh, Rob and I originally, when we did this, we were going to have multiple different examples of different drummers throughout. And we kind of decided that, no, I mean, there's so much info from what you can't have so many people in one episode. It just becomes overload. So I'm glad we gave this whole episode to Mr. Steve Smith. I think it's a great way to start this, what will be a uh, kind of a mini series with Rob. So uh, Rob, this really flew by. I mean, this was just incredible. Um, why don't you tell people right now, like I said before, robhartdrumstudio.com, H-A-R-T. Tell people about you and what you're doing right now beyond that, where they can find you, lessons, all that cool stuff uh, as we close things out. Okay. Well, um, we just released a new website and, uh, actually, uh, one of my keyboard players that I went to school with who passed away, um, his nephew, um, is a tech genius and a musician. He's playing, uh, he's in Southern California, uh, but he's, he's a, a, a code genius. He built the website for me. Uh, shout out to Ty Tyler Seppala. And, um, it is, um, Online lessons, you can take online lessons with me over, um, you know, any uh, Skype or Zoom. Uh, it's also, I've got my lesson courses that are videoed that are available. Um, there's a subscription model there. And if you want to stop by my studio in the Bay Area, that's offered too. So um, we have everything on there. Um, it's It really turned out great. Um, I actually do have a YouTube channel, uh, which is Rob Hart Trio you know, on you, YouTube, and uh, you can check out a lot of stuff there, too. I post a lot of different solos and lessons. Um, yep. And yeah, reach out and get in touch with me. I'm, I'm really eager to, um, you know, connect with people, especially this time of post-COVID. Yeah, really. It's nice to get back and see people and do things like that. But now it's a mix of the two of online lessons and in person. Your website looks great, my friend. I will say I've seen it uh, from before and I've seen it now. So he did a great job. And uh, I mean, you can focus on doing the lessons and knowing that it's kind of a necessary evil. This just massive project of a website where it really does look very good. So again, everyone, Rob Hart, drumstudio.com. Check it out. Take some lessons with Rob, uh, because the key to all this is when you're taking lessons with Rob, you're then taking you know, secondhand lessons with all of the great teachers who he has experienced and and had a lot of time with, such as Steve Smith, Tony Williams, Mike Clark, uh, Robbie Gonzalez, Scott Morris. So, um, Rob, why don't we cue it up then? I think the next one that I would love to do 
is maybe we do Mike Clark next. I think he's kind of another personality online that people are well aware of. Not that the other folks you have listed are not, but um, I think Mike Clark is a is a phenomenal drummer as well, and I'd love to uh, tackle that one next. How's that sound to you to, to come back and, and talk about Mike Clark? Great. Cool. All right. Well, then, um, Rob, thank you for being here. And a big thank you to Steve Smith for kind of okaying you sharing these like uh, behind the, the, the closed lesson doors experiences. Um, so big thanks to Steve Smith. Um, everyone can go and check out Steve Smith on he's on YouTube. He's a, he has a website. He's on Facebook, all that good stuff. I'll put links in the description for Steve Smith's current, you know, offerings and all that good stuff. Um, so Rob, thank you for being here, my friend. Thank you so much for having me, Bart.